Today's project is a portfolio enclosure. It's much more substantial than a phased box, but a lot easier to make than a clamshell enclosure. I think they're particularly good for um, soft covered books, such as this uh, older pamphlet. It's a great way to take a fragile object that's got a lot of natural wear from its history to be able to protect it so that it can go onto a shelf while preserving that history. It's also a really good way to preserve loose sheets. If these wonderful prints uh, didn't have an enclosure already, they'd be a perfect candidate for a portfolio enclosure. The design comes from this book on boxes from the Library of Congress that was compiled by Margaret Brown. It's a fairly simple project, but the cut list of materials is, is a little bit convoluted. So I've put a spreadsheet together, that, and I'll put a link uh, in the description to the spreadsheet. You can measure the dimensions of the book and the materials that you're going to use. Put those into the spreadsheet and the spreadsheet will give you the cut list for all the components. Actually there's some components later in the project where you actually take the measurements from the partially completed portfolio. So I start by trimming uh, four boards a little larger than necessary and the dimensions of the four boards come from the spreadsheet. If you have a very precise board cutter then you could cut them directly to size uh, but mine's not completely square and uh, I do a better cut with a knife so I'll rough them over size and then cut them to size with a knife. I normally use a strip of wood at the back of my bench to square up boards, but in the videos you'll often see me use a bench hook, and we use this in courses as well. I've had a question about this bench hook, so I thought I'd just show a few details. It's a piece of MDF, slightly larger than the cutting mat, with a piece of timber screwed to the front and back. There's not much to it, and it just hooks onto the front of the bench, and the back piece of wood is used to put a square against to square up boards. So the first thing I will do is straighten one edge and then square one end on each of the boards and mark them so I remember which is which. There's a tool that's used to space the joints. In the book there's a significant discussion about how thick this tool should be. But in general I've found that one board thickness and five thicknesses of the covering, covering material uh, works really well. And that is what it recommends in the section on the portfolio. I cut that tool about 20 millimeters shorter than the width of the book. Uh, so I'll make one up here now. So I've got my spacer. I'll glue up five pieces of the covering material. They're slightly longer than the spacer and I'll trim it up once, they've, once it's dried. When I cut the four boards roughly to size, there was three the same size and one slightly larger. So I'll start by cutting the three smaller boards to their exact size. So I'll start with the base board and then board number three. Board number three is the same size as the base board. So I'll take the measurements off the base board once I've cut it.
board one is the baseboard and board three is the top flap. The inner flap is slightly smaller. From the larger board, I'll cut the four wall boards. In the book, it suggests that the short wall board grain direction should go uh, the opposite to what it ends up, but uh, because it's so narrow, it, it uh, really doesn't matter, so I'm comfortable with the grain direction in those short wall boards not being the same as in the book. The spreadsheet calculates to fractions of a millimetre. Now, I can't cut to fractions of a millimeter, but I can cut to the half millimeter. So I round the measurements up to the nearest half millimeter. So 0.7 becomes 1, for instance. The width of the wall boards is probably where this is the most important, because you want a snug fit, just light pressure on the object. Uh, but you don't want it loose and you don't want too much pressure. And that will be determined by the thickness of these wall boards. So once the wall boards are cut, what's left of the larger board becomes the half flaps that fold in from the top and bottom. So I start by cutting it to the size of uh, the two flaps and then cut them, cut it in half to get the two half flaps. Once I have the two equally sized half flaps, I taper them in three millimeters. We don't want these inner flaps holding the portfolio open. So a very small taper, just three millimeters or less. And that's all the boards cut. And the last thing I'll do before cutting the covering material is to trim up the spacer. I deliberately picked a smaller item for this video to demonstrate uh, a portfolio. Because of the flaps that fold out at the top and bottom and one on each side, uh, it does get quite large when it's unfolded and that would have been pretty hard to video on my quite small bench. So my spreadsheet only goes up to this step of cutting the outside covering material, mainly because uh, everything from this point on, it's best to cut to the size as measured off the partially completed portfolio, uh, plus I've just run out of time. Something I forgot to mention is that I will have a diagram that shows where each of these boards goes uh, and I'll put a link to that diagram in the description.
So we start by gluing the central baseboard and then use the spacer tool to glue the others all relative to this central baseboard. I'm not sure there's much to say about this except you glue the wall boards on first. By the time you do the four wall boards, the first one that you did will be set enough that you can then do the other flaps. If you do a wall board and then the corresponding flap, uh, the wall board's probably going to slip because it probably hasn't had quite enough time to key to the covering material. I'm going to use 20 millimeter turn-ins, but uh, you could use 15 or 25, uh, whatever you prefer. I'm going to use a pencil to just mark these inside corners because we want to uh, do a diagonal cut out from the corner of the baseboard and I don't want to overcut the turn-ins. So once I know where that diagonal cut's going to go to, I will cut the turn-ins. Once the turn-ins are all cut to size, I'll uh, trim the corners at 45 degrees. I'll do that one and a half board widths away from the corner, just like a normal cloth corner on a cloth covered book. And we'll do the same corner on those. Once we've done the outside corners, we'll do the uh, cut on the inside corners as well. The cut on the inside corners of the turn-ins goes from the, inside, uh, the outside corner of the baseboard to the inside corner of the turn-ins. Before we do the turn-ins, we have to do something about the corner, 
corners of the baseboards. Of all the pieces of material that's going to go over this portfolio, nothing will cover that corner. So we have to put some material in, a little L-shaped piece of material to cover the corner of the baseboards. So the L shape will be 20 millimeters wide. Well, the same width as the turn ends. And it's uh, like I mentioned, it's best to measure this from the portfolio. So you draw it in place and then measure uh, 20 millimeters onto the baseboard out to the edge of the outside flap. And then I add two millimeters for each of the grooves that the material will get pushed into. I think it'll make sense when you see me do it. It's a bit hard to explain. So there's two pairs of these L-shaped pieces of cloth. They're each mirror image of each other and each pair is a different size because of the different size of the left and right wall boards. So we'll glue these in place and the thickness gauge becomes a really useful tool for uh, forcing the cloth into the joints and getting them nice and square at the bottom of the grooves. Now that the corners of the baseboard are protected, we can do all the turn-ins. The book says to do the inside turn-ins first. I guess it's uh, analogous to the head and the tail of the book. And the cloth corners are done exactly the same as cloth corners on a book.
Now once the glue is dried, you can do a quick check just to make sure that everything's on track and that you've got the dimensions right. I haven't mentioned it, but I'm using straight PVA for all of the gluing. Now's the time to put the ties in before we do the inside lining. I like using two ties to keep the portfolio closed, but for a small uh, object like this we probably could have got away with one. So once we've got four ribbons cut, a little bit longer than we need, it's just a matter of using a wood chisel, the same width as the ribbons, and using that chisel to cut uh, slots for the ribbons. The bevel of the chisel will produce a bit of a ramp in the slot. So you want that ramp in the direction of the pull on the ribbons. So you have the bevel of the chisel in the direction of the outside edge of the portfolio. So just use a piece of wood uh, underneath the boards to chisel into. Now I'm going in roughly a quarter of the height and 20 millimeters, the same uh, depth in as the turn ins. So once we knock those holes through the boards, uh, I'm going to cut a very shallow uh, groove and use the chisel to scrape the, a thin layer of the board out so that the ribbon is uh, recessed so it's not very noticeable under the covering material. Use a thin blunt object like a unsharpened micro spatula to push the ribbons in and then glue them in place. Now it's time to do the inside linings. The lining material for boards 1, the base board, the central board, and flap 2, the first board that comes over, are done with a different material than the other flaps. The idea being that it makes it obvious that the object gets put into the center of the portfolio and the first flap that should be folded over is flap 2, the one with the same material as the central board. Whereas the other flaps will be lined with the same material as the cover. So we'll start by lining uh, flap 3 and the top and bottom flaps, 4 and 5. Now the the lining material will go to within three millimeters of the edges of the boards on the outsides and will extend over the inside joints and 20 millimeters, the width of the turn ends, onto the baseboard. So this is best measured directly from the, from the portfolio. 
though you could calculate it as well, but you would end up checking it anyway. And again, because they go over the joints and will get forced into the joints, you add two millimeters for each joint. Why two millimeters? Well, the board is one and a half millimeters or 1.6 millimeters thick, uh, but the it will sort of be rounded at the bottom, so it probably needs about two millimeters of material to go into the joint. If you're using thicker board, then you might want to increase that. So if you're using two millimeter boards, then maybe you want uh, to add three millimeters for each of the joints. And the top and bottom flaps need to be tapered to match the taper on the boards. I just judged that by eye. I know it was a three millimeter taper, and then I'll compare it to the portfolio, and if it's not enough, I can trim it up a little bit more. The glue on the ribbons should have dried by now, so if you have any excess, now's the time to trim those up. The book says to trim up the inside covering materials at 45 degrees where they go onto the baseboard so you don't have an overlap of material and an excess thickness. But it doesn't say how to do that. I've tried it a few different ways. The, the first way I tried was to do it, um, to glue it down so it's all wet, and then to uh, trim it, and then to try and peel it back. And um, it, it, the wet material stretched, and, and it was a bit of a mess. So I've come up with this system that seems to work. So I glue out the inside lining material only to the inside joint. So I, I put the lining material in place, I push the material down into the joints so I can see where the joints are, and I only apply the adhesive up to the inner joint. So then I put them in place, force the material down into the joints, but then that inner flap hasn't, doesn't have any adhesive on it. So I go around and do that on all three. And then we'll also do the strip of cloth that covers the uh, other joint area. Now this remaining uh, joint area needs a piece of cloth, the same material as the covering material. Now it'll go onto the boards 20 millimeters, the same as the turn ends. And again, it's best measured off the portfolio. Uh, again, two millimeters for each of the joints. And I'm doing it three millimeters short from the uh, head and tail. So it's six millimeters less than the height of the board. And I, I drew a line 20, 20 millimeters away from the joint, just so I've got a line to pitch the cloth to.
here's my little trick for trimming up the overlapping material. So I put a thin piece of card, manila card in this case, underneath the overlapping materials, cut them at 45 degrees. Because of the thickness of the card, they'll end up still overlapping a little bit, but I'll be able to see how much and be able to trim that off, and then they'll match nicely. So I'll go around and do that four times. And once they're all trimmed at the corners, it's just a matter of going around and gluing down the flaps. Now we just have two boards left to line, the central baseboard and then the number two flap, which is the first flap that will get folded in. So these are done with a different material to make this obvious where to put the object and which flap to fold in first. So I'll use a nice piece of uh, paper for this. It's a matching color. And I'll trim it up so there's a three millimeter margin uh, around the outside of the paper. The book on boxes from the Library of Congress is online, so I'll put a link to that in the description of this video. Some of the steps in this project have been uh, a little difficult to convey on a video, so if you have any questions, please put them in the comments and I'll make sure I answer those. But I hope I've covered enough material so that you can successfully make a portfolio. They're a great thing for a, a family heirlooms, objects that don't get used much and you want to preserve the wear of. So you, you don't want to restore them, you just want to keep them as they are. And it's much simpler to make than a box. So here's the finished product with a label. I think portfolios are underrated. I, I think they're a really useful enclosure. Uh, if you haven't come across them before, I hope you consider using them in the future. So I hope you've got something from today's video. And if you've enjoyed it, please, as usual, hit the big thumbs up. If you have any comments or questions, please put them in the comments. If you want to be notified of my future videos, 
please hit the subscribe button. And until next time, cheerio.